Commissioner Kanye, thank you so much for joining us here today on Bloomberg. Um, Europe has stepped up while the U.S. has pulled back when it comes to climate change commitments. What do you think Europe has achieved since Paris? Well, since the Paris Agreement, uh, we have uh, enforced all the legislation needed to achieve our target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, at least by 40 percent by 2030 compared to 1990. So we have overhauled our carbon markets, our emission trading system. We have established binding targets for the member states to reduce emissions in the sectors of agriculture, uh, buildings, uh, transport and waste. We have uh, established targets of CO2 for cars and light vans and heavy duty vehicles. And we have um, approved new legislation on renewables with more ambitious targets and on energy efficiency. So you, we have now all the legislation needed to achieve our 2030 targets. Right. So what is the current, talk to us about the current EU ambition, you know, even more ambitious than 2020, you're looking out to 2030. We have in the European Union, we have decoupled our emissions in 2020 by 22.4 percent. We have been reducing them, even if the, our GDP grew by uh, 50 percent. So we have had economic growth, but at the same time we have reduced emissions. But we will be uh, in, 20, in, in 2020 uh, at the level of more than 20, 23 or 24, but that is not enough. Uh, we have to arrive to more than 40 percent in 2030. And that's the effort we are going to do now. And at the same time, we are going to develop a long-term strategy to fully decarbonize our economies by 2050. We are working on that at the moment. Do all the member states agree with the direction that the bloc is going? Well, in the in a, in a European Union with 28 member states, you have more ambitious member states and member states with less ambition. But they have agreed to all the policy instruments to arrive to the actual uh, targets uh, we have. It's a long discussion. It's a discussion with the parliament sometimes is more uh, ambitious than the, the ministers of the member states. And the European Commission plays uh, the role of honest broker uh, to see an agreement. But uh, overall, there is a high level of ambition. We have the most ambitious targets of all the NDCs uh, under the Paris Agreement, and we are uh, overshooting our targets. You've said the U.S. is on a climate vacation. What's been your view on President Trump pulling out of the Paris Accord and continuing to roll back protections that prior administration had put in place. I share fully the comments of Governor Brown that the, the federal government is, is on, on, on climate vacation, on holidays. It's clear, it's clear. And the decisions taken uh, uh, go backwards in many fields uh, of environmental protection and climate protection. It's, in, it's unbelievable that with a big challenge that the world has, the federal administration is taking this position. And at the same time, which is uh, um, astonishing, is a reaction of the civil society, of NGOs, of uh, companies, of governors, of mayors. So maybe the federal government is on holiday, but the United States is fulfilling the Paris Agreement commitments. It will be much more powerful, the movement, if the federal government was on. But, but the good thing is that the United States, as a country, is not going backwards mm. because of the efforts uh, of people uh, which uh, have understood the challenge and have come along with all the full compromise of the American civil society. America is still in very clearly. How do you balance the need for cheap energy with carbon goals? Well, I think it has nothing to do to reduce emissions and have cheap energy. At the moment, we are developing technology who makes renewables much competitive than uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, generation of power. So the big reduction of prices that we have seen in solar panels on one side and on wind power on another means very competitive and in the auctions of energy we have seen we have seen that renewables are fully competitive we have to solve to solve the problem of the intermittency and variability of renewable sources but com on, from the point of view of price they start to be very competitive and we can decouple our emissions have economic growth develop new technologies and make fair transitions to phase out coal in the different uh, countries which still have coal in their energy mix. If you drive up the cost of energy and pollution, won't they move somewhere else that's cheaper, like China? Are you just outsourcing these problems somewhere else? What I see in the world is that the public opinion is asking for clean air, for quality of air, is asking for cheap energy, and is understanding that the 
impacts of climate change are affecting the daily, the daily basis. So all the governments have to react. The important thing is that to fight global warming is not only enough that the United States, uh, even uh, without the federal government of the European Union, we reduce our emissions. We need India, we need Africa, and we need China on board. That's the big challenge to convince these countries. We are going to be um, developing economically at a big speed that they have to do that economic development using clean energy sources instead of uh, relying on all fossil fuels or coal. You said you're worried about a lithium shortage for batteries for electric vehicles in Europe. Is that still a concern and what are you doing to address it? It's a huge concern. It's a huge concern because we are asking our car manufacturers to reduce the limits of emission of the, all the vehicles. To do that, they have to electrify transport or go to hydrogen. Right? And the big problem at the moment to electrify are two. First of all, batteries are very expensive. Second, we need charging uh, stations all over the place. And the problem with the batteries is that there are no production of batteries in the European Union. We are going to, to develop new models of electric cars, of zero uh, emission vehicles, but we will be dependent on those who produce the batteries at the moment, which are Japan, Korea, and mainly China. And in the future, if we go to clean transportation, there will be a scarcity of varieties that will become expensive. That's why the European Union is also concerned, because there are countries like China which are buying mining rights for rain materials all over the um, developing countries. Russia has assumed a dominant position in the European gas market at the same time the U.S. wants to get more gas into the European market. Are you concerned about Russia's level of influence? We have always been concerned about depending on a single supplier. And that's the policy of the European Union, is to diversify sources, routes, and suppliers. And that's why we have built the necessary alternative pipelines to the Russian pipelines, the Southern Corridor to bring gas from the Caspian and Azerbaijan, that we are supporting the East Met uh, Gas Corridor to bring gas from Egypt and, uh, and Cyprus to the European Union. And why we have developed an LNG gas strategy to be able to accept ship to shipments of gas from other countries, including the United States. So we are, have diversified in order not, not to be dependent exclusively on Russian gas, because when gas is used as a commodity, you have a scenario. But when gas is, may be used as a political weapon, then you have a, a risk from the point of view of security of supply. But do you think U.S. gas will be too expensive to be competitive? I think that uh, LNG can be competitive with, with, with um, gas pipelines, uh, coming with gas pipelines in the future. And that's why we have prepared all our infrastructure to have LNG plants all over the European Union to, to, to be able to accept shipments. It will depend on the price for sure, and it will depend on the American exporters to compete in the global gas markets. But what we have un, uh, uh, learned is that when there was a single route of supply of Russian gas to a country like Lithuania, and then Lithuania establish a, 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 an LNG gas plan, automatically the prices decline for Russian gas. So what yeah. we want is competition in the market and also, and then uh, uh, our companies will buy the most convenient gas and that gas who, who has a secure uh, supply. And the United States is a secure partner in the, in, in the energy field because for the United States, um, oil and gas is a commodity, it's not a political tool.